Well, I think I'll, I'll start with the, uh, you guys, those of you who've been to my talks before know that I, I tend to get on little tangents and ramble a lot, and I usually open with a tangent and ramble a lot. So I might as well start with my opening rambling tangent, um, since it's right exactly 10 o'clock. Uh, mostly the opening rambling tangent is, hey, welcome to the science circle, which, uh, of course, I'm not in charge of at all. That would be uh, Chantal, who's back there, and Jess, who might be lurking around here somewhere. Um, I didn't see her, but she might be here hiding. Um, if you don't know, there are talks most weeks, at least most weeks during the school year, here uh, at this time and also at other times. So you can check up on the um, either the group notices or the website for the Science Circle to see what else is on the calendar. There's a number of people who come here and give talks. And today I am Rob Knopp. I am a associate professor of physics at a really small liberal arts college in Western Pennsylvania called Westminster College. And um, I've, I've been around a bit. When I first, when I gave my first talk in Second Life, I was at Vanderbilt, and then I actually worked at Linden Lab for a couple of years, and then I was at another place, Quest University. So I'm just lost. I have no idea where I am. I wander a lot. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about the first stars. And I mentioned that I was going to give this talk to somebody, and they said, oh, you mean the, uh, uh, the, the first people who out in front of the Man Chinese Theater put their handprints in, in the uh, uh, sidewalk there? I said, yes, yes, that's what I meant by the first stars. Actually, no, what I mean by the first stars is uh, I, I probably we should come up with a way of describing it using the word renaissance because the first stars mark the end of the Dark Ages. Now, nowadays, anybody who knows any history at all gets all grouchy when you talk about the European Dark Ages because it's based on a false idea about what was going on, so on and so forth. But that's not what I'm here talking about. As far as I'm concerned, all of that stuff is right now because we want to look much further in the past than that back to the first stars. And the first stars is one of the hot topics in astronomy right now and has been for some time. And there have been purported detections of either sort of generalized glow or secondary observations, but nothing really completely convincing of the first stars. But um, we have seen back to a time when there was no stars and we see stars now. So, um, unless basic things like counting don't really work, somewhere in between there had to be a first generation of stars. So uh, the JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to launch, I think it's now two years off. For a long time, it was five years off, but now it's down to two years off. So maybe in two years, we'll be down to just a year and a half off before the launch, something like that. Sooner or later, it might actually launch too, but we always have to allow for the possibility of the complete financial collapse of the United States before it goes up. But we'll see. Um, one of the supposed primary missions of the JWST is going to be to try to characterize and learn about the first stars. That's one of the things that astronomers are hoping that it's going to do. So we'll see when it actually goes up what it does. But in the meantime, we are using the resources we have available to us now, which includes not just the Hubble Space Telescope, but all sorts of ground-based instruments and some other space-based instruments to see, can we make any observations that tell us anything about the nature of the first stars and uh, when they happened and things like that. We do know a fair amount now. We have a fair amount that has observational constraints, but there still are some pretty big open questions. So, the first stars. Well, before we talk about the first stars, um, I want to talk about stars in general, but I'm just suddenly realizing I never attached my HUD that allows me to uh, control my screen. So let me do that right now. Presentation spelling counts here, it turns out. Here we go. If you're searching your inventory, spelling counts. All right, good. Um, go on, you can download the texture. It's okay, you can do it. It's all blurry. I don't know which button to push. I'm going to guess it's that one. Ooh, I guessed well. Um, all right. So if we're going to talk about the first stars, we want to talk a little bit about stars in general. And so we're going to go from the specific stars to general stars. And when we talk about stars in general, we often start with the sun because that's the closest and most familiar star. So we'll go from general back to specific, but a different specific this time. Um, the slide I have behind me is a slide that I use in a quite a number of different uh, 
astronomy classes I teach because it turns out the evolution of the sun is relevant to a whole bunch of different things. Um, and because we're going to be talking about how the first stars formed, how the sun formed and how stars in general form is actually quite relevant. So um, it all starts with gas clouds. Everything's gas in space. Um, interst interstellar molecular cloud. Now, not all the gas clouds in the galaxy or in space are actually molecular clouds. In fact, it turns out most of the gas clouds in space are actually plasma, and they're in between galaxies inside galaxy clusters. But okay, that's not where stars are going to form, um, at least nowadays. And where stars form are the cooler clouds. And why the cooler clouds? Because those are the ones that can collapse and get dense enough um, to actually trigger enough density to be a star. And we define a star in this context as something that can do fusion at its core to generate energy. So it starts with a molecular cloud. Um, parts of the inside are able to cool enough that you get these collapsing cloud cores. And if you zoom in on one of these cloud cores, um, if you zoom a whole lot, because it turns out when this happens, you can form thousands or more stars at once. So if you look at the Orion Nebula, there's thousands of stars there that have formed in the last couple million years. But if you zoom in enough, eventually you'll see a protostar, which for the sun was a phase that lasted about 10 million years. Um, protostar typically has a thing that's hot. And why is it hot? Well, remember I said that the clouds have to be cool for the things to collapse. And the reason is, is that as they collapse, they heat back up. There's energy that's released as stuff falls in on itself. Gravitational potential energy, if you know about that kind of thing. Um, if not, it's the same thing that when you drop an asteroid to try and make dinosaurs go extinct, which, you know, we do that around here sometimes. Um, and it, the whole thing heats up tremendously. Well, why? It's because the energy of its, you know, there's sort of its motion, but the energy originally that was given to it by gravity gets turned into heat via either friction with the atmosphere, and that's why meteorites burn up, or just by colliding. But in any event, you let all this gas get close to each other and it heats up. So this protostar here, the sun when it's a protostar, is actually not shining the way the sun shines. It hasn't really turned on nuclear fusion yet. It's just shining because of all that heat that it got by collapsing. And then there's often a disk of junk around the star, and we have actually seen uh, proplids or protoplanetary disks, for instance, in the Orion Nebula, where planetary systems are forming. Uh, eventually, you get to a star that's just like the sun, what we call a main sequence star. And the sun will stay a main sequence star for 10 billion years. It's about halfway done. We're about 5 billion years in. So, you know, no worries yet. Sort of like a person who's, I don't know, 40 years old or something like that. Um, so I guess the sun is really old. And... Um, at the very end of the sun's life, just before it dies, it's going to become a red giant. The sun will last in that stage for about a million years. Um, and the red giant stage is actually multiple different stages. If you really look closely at stellar evolution, you subdivide that phase into a whole bunch of different stuff going on. But I like to just sort of combine it together in once it's done being a regular main sequence star, it gets bigger. And it'll sort of get bigger and smaller and redder and, and yellower over the course of several stages. And when it's finally done with all of that, it'll slough off its outer, outer layers, which expand as a planetary nebula, leaves behind the very, very hot core, which is no longer doing any nuclear fusion. It's just really hot because it was doing fusion for a long time. The planetary nebula spreads out and just sort of diffuses into the general interstellar gas and left behind is a little white dwarf star which just sits there forever more cooling off. And that's what something like the sun is going to do. All right. So that's great. Now, here's the things that's probably most important. Well, there's three things that are really important about this. First is how they form from clouds. Second, time scales. 10 billion years. We have this problem that if you're a human and you say 100,000 years, a million years, a billion years, or 10 billion years, they all are a long time. But they are also very different times when you compare them to other relevant things. So to compare those to relevant things, the age of the universe is about 13 billion years. So 10 billion years is less than the age of the universe, but comparable. So the sun is about 5 billion years old, which means it's a little more than a third as old. Actually, really, it's four and a half. It's a little, a very close to as third the age of the universe for the sun. All right, so that's pretty important, these kinds of timescales that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, a star like the sun 
won't last as long as the universe. But if there was one that was made 10 billion years ago, it could still be around, just barely. Um, but if there, won't, there was one that was made just right after the Big Bang, it wouldn't be around anymore. And then second, what they leave behind, right? These white dwarves, there should be white dwarves absolutely all over the place because lots of stars leave them behind and they last forever. And sure enough, there are white dwarves absolutely all over the place. Um, they tend not to be very bright because they're very small. When they very first get started, they're bright, but that doesn't last very long. So even when they're pretty hot, because they're so small, they're white dwarves, they're about the size of the Earth which is small for a star, that means they don't put out enough light to be easily seen far away. So we, we don't see them. In fact, you can't see any white dwarves with your naked eye in the sky, but you can. There's a few that you can see if you know where to look with an 8-inch telescope. All right, so that's what the sun does. Now, stars in general actually have different paths. So all stars go through more or less the same kind of pre-main sequence, although um, the speed at which it happens is different for different stars, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, they all go through the main sequence. That's when they're fusing hydrogen at their core, and that's what defines a main sequence star, really. I mean, that's not originally what defined a main sequence star, but nowadays that's reasonable to say that's what defines a main sequence star. That's a star during the main part of its life. Stars spend typically 90% of their lives in this stage. They all do something like a giant. It's either a giant or a supergiant, and they all do something like that at the end of their life. Um, and that lasts about 10% as long as the main sequence did. But then what happens after that is different for different kinds of stars. So for the sun, I already said they slough off a planetary nebula, which quickly on stellar timescales expands and joins the uh, general interstellar gas, leaving behind a white dwarf, which is just this, this very small thing, something like 60% the mass of the sun and... Uh, it's like a diamond in the sky. It's a carbon or carbon and oxygen degenerate matter thing the size of the Earth sitting there cooling off. Stars up to eight times the mass of the sun, that's what they'll do. But if they are more than eight times the mass of the sun, um, stuff can happen differently in their core than happens in the core of the sun. The sun, I mean when it's going to leave behind something just like carbon and oxygen, in fact the sun probably won't leave much oxygen and it might even leave behind just a helium carbon white dwarf but stars up to eight times the mass of the sun never really do fusion to things um heavier than oxygen stars up to eight times the mass of the sun maybe you'll get some neon in some of these white dwarfs too but for most part that's all the fusion they do more massive stars because their cores get so much more compressed are able to fuse elements all the way up to iron and then when they do that and they have iron at their core um they sort of run out of things to do. And what do you do when you're bored and you've run out of things to do? You explode, right? It's just like a little child. So they explode in a core collapse supernova, which, oops, excuse me, while I fall over here. Okay. They explode in, in a core collapse supernova. The entire star gets blown away. There's expanding 10th um, you know, the speed of light gas clouds that go into the interstellar gas. Foom, giant foom, most of the mass of the star is blown away, but left behind is, at least for modest big stars, a neutron star, which we may well see as a pulsar. The classic example of that is the Crab Nebula. There was a supernova that was observed in, um, oh, I always forget if that was 1006 or 1054. I think that one was 1054. Um, was recorded by Chinese astronomers. I don't think anybody in Europe or the Arab world recorded it, but Chinese astronomers did record it. And 1054, if you look there now, there's the Crab Nebula, which is the expanding supernova remnant. And at the center of the Crab Nebula, there is a pulsar. And that's a neutron star. And what a neutron star is, is something that's one to two times the mass of the sun, but it's as dense as an atomic nucleus. So you'll get something that's the mass of the sun, but packed into just 10 kilometers across. It's really, really, really freaking dense. Um, and that's what's left behind from one of these. Yes. And um, we have um, actually observed gravitational waves from colliding neutron stars. But the most massive stars, so the ones more than maybe 15 times the mass of the sun, when they explode, the gravity at their core turns out to be too much for even atomic nuclear forces to support them. And they leave behind a black hole. So most important thing from this slide is that depending on the mass of the star, you might leave behind one of these white dwarfs. But if it's a really massive star, it'll go supernova and leave behind either a neutron star or for the most massive one, will leave behind a black hole.
what we just saw is that a star's mass determines its destiny. It sounds so very um, ominous when you state it that way. Destiny, maybe your fate. You have a destiny. And the stars that are like the sun here live about 10 billion years and will leave behind a white dwarf. It turns out that the bigger the star, the faster it lives. So if you have a star that's only 0.3 times the mass of the sun, and there's lots of those. There's lots of these little red dwarfs, we call them out there, that are between, say, 0.3 and 0.8 times the mass of the sun. And something that's 0.3 times the mass of the sun will actually hasn't be, it, it's dim enough, it's producing little enough energy that it can keep burning for 100 billion years, which is a lot longer than the age of the universe. And what that means is every star that is 0.3 times the mass of the sun, and this is actually true all the way up to something like 0.8 times the mass of the sun, each one of those stars that's ever been created is still sitting there burning away. So if any of the very first stars that were created were low mass like this, um, they'll still be around today. And then we maybe have some hope of being able to see them. The most massive stars, though, hardly live very long at all. So a six solar mass star, so that's one that would still leave behind a white dwarf, only lives 100 million years. Now, it's, you know, if you're a human, which I'm guessing many of the people here are, when you say only 100 million years, that sounds kind of funny because humans live 100 years if they do really well. And 100 million years sounds like a long time. Um, tagline, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, that's, um, sounds like a long time, but for a star, it's really not. And again, if you think about it compared to the age of the universe, it's, uh, roughly 1% the age of the universe. And so that means stars like this that have formed over the history of the universe, most of them have formed and died. And this is part of why we expect there to be so many white dwarves around. But if you get to a really massive star, like one that's going to go supernova, it's going to live, um... Yeah, you, that's right. You don't want to take every day for granted when you only live a few hundred million years. But the really massive stars only live millions or maybe tens of millions of years, and then they go to supernova. So on, and, and remember, the sun is a protostar, or a pre-main sequence star, as we call it, forming planets for something like 10 million years. So during the time the sun is still busy collecting its planetary system, a star nearby that's 10 times the mass of the sun will form, live its entire life, and explode. So they, they live fast and they die hard is what happens to these really big stars. So any big star that you see on stellar timescales, it was formed recently in the last 10 million years or so because that's all the longer that they live. Uh, it's also worth talking about what kinds of stars are out there. And so this is, you know, it's not necessarily a representative sample of our galaxy, but it's not too bad. If you take, so 10 parsecs, that's about 30 light years. If you try and look at all of the stars within 30 light years of the sun, you find about 180 of them. And this is based on account of the Hipparchos catalog. That was a satellite that went up and measured distances to stars Oh, I don't know, a little more than 10 years now is when it did all that stuff, maybe 15 years ago. Um, most of them are main sequence stars. 86% of the stars are main sequence stars, and that shouldn't be surprising, given that stars live mostly, most of their lives on the main sequence. Um, a few percent are giants. Um, about 10% of them are actually too dim that Hipparchos couldn't classify them, but probably most of them were either white dwarves or just very low mass main sequence stars. There were only two white dwarves, but they're almost certainly undercounted, which means even as close as 30 parsecs of the sun, Hipparchos was not sensitive enough to see the really dimmest white dwarf stars. So there's almost certainly more of those out there. So, all right, there should be lots of white dwarves, but it didn't count them all. Most of the stars, we'll call it 90-ish percent, are main sequence stars, and something like 4% are giants. So that gives you a sense. Not many giants, and given that that's only 10% of the lifetime of a star, that makes sense. If you look at their colors, we classify stars by their colors, which is also their temperature. So there's this classic OBAFGKM, yeah, and, and Sizzigizzy, Sizzigi, Sizzigi, Sizzigi. I've, I've learned how to pronounce this before, and I always forget. Tells us the classic acronym for, or not acronym, um, whatever you call those things, for remembering this, which is OB, a fine girl, kiss me. And, of course, even back when I was in grad school, last millennium, people commented how sexist this all was. Mnemonic, thank you, that's the word I was looking for. 
Um, and Sky and Telescope, I think it was, held a contest for people to come up with a new mnemonic that you could use that wouldn't be um, sexist so that people could remember this. And of course, people still use the one that they used always. But um, two of them uh, I want to mention. One of them is over budget answer for grads, craft macaroni. And that's my favorite one because I was a grad student at the time this happened. So it really spoke to me. Uh, but the other one is the one that you say uh, that, that if somebody's complaining it's uh, sexist, you say only boys accepting feminism get kissed meaningfully. So there you go. In any event, what's important about this, though, is not the actual letters, but just that on the left of this diagram are the blue hot stars. On the right are the red cool stars, although when I say cool, I'm still talking one or 2,000 Kelvin. Um, Diggy. Syzygy? I'm not familiar with that word. Anyway, um, these on the main sequence, these stars over here, the blue ones, are the ones that live fast and die hard. So these stars, O and B stars, are the high mass stars, and the K and M stars are the low mass stars. And notice, within 30 parsecs of the sun, or sorry, 30 light years of the sun, there are no O or B stars. So that tells you something about how rare they are. O and B stars are very rare. When you make a few thousand stars, you only make a few O and B stars, typically. Um, you get down to A stars, um, and then after the plus are giants here. So A and F stars, you start seeing some G stars like the sun. There's a lot, but most of them are K and M stars. So most of the stars are actually cooler than, than the sun and less ma lower mass than the sun. So nowadays, when you make stars, you mostly make lots and lots and lots of low mass stars. You make some stars that are like the sun, you know, a decent number of stars that are like the sun so that you look out in space and you can see a bunch and go look for planets around them you know, move there because our, our planet is terrible now, whatever. We didn't do it, though. Humanity has nothing to do with why it's terrible here. Um, stars hotter than the sun start to get pretty rare, but they're there. But the really hottest stars, the big, massive ones, the ones that are going to go supernova are extremely rare. And remember, I said that if you see a star that is a few million years old, it means it has, or sorry, if you see a star that is, more than eight times the mass of the sun. It lives at most tens of millions of years. So on a galactic time scale, they sort of explode as fast as they're made. Well, in a galaxy like ours, you can expect a supernova from one of those exploding stars roughly once every hundred years, more or less. Although we're kind of overdue. Uh, the last one that was observed in our, actually in our galaxy, um, was back in the early 17th century. There are, in fact, two within a few decades of each other back in the late 16th, early 17th century. And there has been at least one or two, but it was behind lots of dust clouds, so we didn't actually, nobody on Earth saw it as a supernova. So we're kind of overdue, but it's a random process. But that tells you, um, you every hundred years, about one of these stars gets formed, and that's about it. So these are very rare stars, these really high-mass stars that are going to go to supernova that hardly live at all. So that's, that's the stars that we have um, in our galaxy as we know them today. They're mostly little red dwarf stars. They're mostly main sequence stars. But it turns out there's one other way that we can um, divide these stars into classifications. We like to divide things especially into classifications of type 1 and type 2 just because that's the very beginning of noticing patterns of saying, hey, this set is different from that set. So um, early on in the 20th century, um, astronomers recognized that there seemed to be two different um, types of stars that got the names, yes, population one and population two. And that just means population one is a bunch of stars that have one set of characteristics and population two have another set. Um, these three things more or less tell you what the, the key differences are. In fact, the really key difference here is this one that's highlighted in red. Um, metallicity is astronomers speak for... Um, fraction of elements other than hydrogen and helium. So astronomers have a very strange definition of the word metal. Oxygen is a metal if you're an astronomer. Um, it took me a little while to adapt to that. But now I've adapted to it, and so now I'm pushing it on you and telling you that um, high metallistic stars are stars that have lots of carbon and oxygen, and oxygen in them. Yes, you have to inhale some metal deeply because um, you got to breathe that carbon. So. Um, 
the sun is about, by mass, 2% stuff other than hydrogen and helium, and that is high metallicity. It doesn't sound like it to you because the Earth, of course, is way more than 2% hydrogen and helium, but that's because the Earth's composition is not very representative of the gas cloud that the solar system formed from, whereas the sun is. And why? Because the high mass stuff is the stuff that's able to... Um, the high mass stuff is the stuff that's able to collect together and make planets stick together, make molecules and rocks and planets and stuff like that. Um, whereas the center of the solar system is the gravitational center is where most of the mass collected, and that's where the sun is. So the sun has high metallicity, 2% elements other than hydrogen and helium, whereas a population two star has low but not zero metallicity, so it might be a tenth down to even say a ten thousandth or a thousandth um, of the uh, metallicity of the sun. So it can be really low metallicity, but they're never zero. There always is some carbon and some oxygen and some iron in these stars. Um, the population two stars and the population two stars, most of them are old. Um, almost all of them, at least in our galaxy, are old stars, whereas in the population one stars are a mix of old and new. Some of the really old stars are population one. Some of the five billion year old ones like the sun are population one. And all the stars that we see that are new forming in star formation reasons in the disk of the galaxy, they're all population one stars. Um, and population two stars are mostly found in the halo of the galaxy, for instance, in globular clusters. Um, those are all population two low metallicity stars and globular clusters, which are in the halo of our galaxy, whereas um, open clusters, which are in the disk of our galaxy, and those all formed sometime in the last few hundred million years, like the Pleiades here, those are all population one stars. So population one and population two, the important thing is population two stars have low but not zero concentration of heavy elements other than hydrogen and helium, whereas population one stars um, have lots, although lots compared to um, what other stars have, not lots in an absolute sense. Um, this is just another thing. Uh, the disk and the halo of our galaxy are characteristic of population one and population two. Uh, that's not really, they're not really defined by where they are, but it turns out that if you're looking in the disk, you're seeing mostly population one stars. If you're looking in the halo, you're seeing almost all population two stars. And that's true of other galaxies like ours as well. Well, all right. So I made a big deal about this heavy element stuff. So it's clearly important. And where does all, all, where do all of the elements we have come from? Well, ultimately, it's the Big Bang because that's where everything came from. So in the very early universe, the Big Bang happened, and we don't really even have a clear idea of what exactly that was. But the stuff that happened, quote unquote, after the Big Bang, we actually understand a fair amount of that pretty well. And one of the things we understand very well about this that matches observational constraints we've seen is which elements were created in the Big Bang. So at the beginning of the universe, yes, about 10 minutes after the Big Bang, um, all the elements were created, and this is all the more that was created, mostly hydrogen about 75% by mass, and then most of the rest was helium, and everything else was completely tiny. So you think about the sun, which is 2% elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, none of that stuff came from the Big Bang, and yeah, maybe some of the beryllium. Turns out lithium actually uh, gets used up in stars, but we won't go there. It's because they're bipolar and they need to take lithium. Um, so the Big Bang made hydrogen and helium, and you can pretty much ignore all the other elements that the Big Bang made because it's just such a tiny fraction. I mean, it's very important if you want to test your models of what was made in the Big Bang because exactly what that tiny fraction is is predicted by the model and actually matches some observations that have been made. But from the point of view of looking at what's in stars, hydrogen and helium is all that came from the Big Bang. And if you think about it, that means that the first generation of stars – are made from material that came from the Big Bang have to be basically all hydrogen and helium. Uh, yeah, CB make, ask the question, right? Everything other than hydrogen helium is made in stars or in supernova or in neutron stars colliding. And of course, neutron stars are left behind by stars. So stars are responsible for creating all the other elements that we have. So if there's any oxygen in your body, you know it was created in a star. And hint, there's oxygen in your body. If you don't believe me, cut yourself, watch yourself bleed. Is it red? If so, there's oxygen in your body. Also, 
By the way, it's not the oxygen that makes it red. It's the iron that makes it red. And iron is made in supernova or colliding neutron stars. So if you have iron in your body, which you do, um, that was made in a supernova or maybe a colliding neutron star. So you guys have been so, through some really tough places. But so then if you think about it, there's sort of a um, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem in that every star we see has um, some fraction of heavy elements in it. But those heavy elements are made in stars. So where were the first heavy elements made? Well, that's going to be the first stars. Uh, so if you want to think about this, this is sort of my. Uh, Big, the cycle of star formation and death. It is. It's a big cycle of life, um, but specifically focusing on where do heavy elements come from. So, right, the universe begins. We have hydrogen and helium, and basically that's it. Um, traces of uh, lithium and beryllium, and that gives us the initial. I'm not sure you'd call it interstellar gas if there's no gas, no stars for it to be between. But whatever, the gas in the universe, and then you get the collapsing. Cloud cores, stars form, stars evolve, and the amount of time it takes them to evolve is very different for different types of stars. We've seen it's just a few million years if it's a really massive one. The lowest mass stars, in fact, take so long to evolve that all the gas that's in them basically gets locked up in them. It is never returned to the interstellar gas. It will be eventually, but only when the universe is much older than it is right now. So all those stars are still just kind of hanging around. So that's not, you can't make more stars from that gas because they're still being used in current stars. The short-lived stars will very quickly supernova, and then the supernova send their gas, spread it back out into the interstellar gas, and that gas is enriched with heavy elements. Now, it's not all heavy elements, but it adds some heavy elements to that, including the stuff that was made in the stars, as well as just in the supernova explosion itself, there's all kind of fusion um, that creates other elements. So those go and get mixed back into the interstellar gas. So the next stars that are formed from the interstellar gas now will have some heavy elements in them, because the previous generation of stars through supernova enriched it with heavy elements. And then eventually the medium lifetime stars, like the really long lived ones never die, but the medium lifetime stars will eventually eject their planetary nebula. And there's some carbon and oxygen enrichment that was made at the core of those stars and they got dredged up by convection in those stars. Some of that also goes into the interstellar gas. So as the stars that don't live too terribly long, either they live fast and they go supernova and they give you lots, or they live a little bit longer and they give you some carbon and oxygen, um, those will enrich the interstellar gas with heavy elements so that the next time stars are made, they can have some heavy elements. And that would be population two stars. Those are the stars that have some heavy elements, but not lots. To get to population one stars, you have to go through this cycle several times. Although notice, if you get just to this part of the cycle, it doesn't take very long. It takes 10 million years, something like that. So that's hardly any time compared to the age of the universe. So you can go through this cycle a whole bunch of times and enrich the gas a fair amount. And then eventually you're making population one stars. So you see stars like the sun today were formed from gas that had been processed through cycles of star formation several times, at least. And then there's also the... Um, uh, it turns out that some of these supernovae, they don't just directly enrich it with heavy elements, but they leave behind neutron stars. Most of the neutron stars will just sit there and their mass is never returned to the gas, but occasionally two neutron stars collide with each other. And when that happens, um, most of the material that comes out is not hydrogen. And so you're going to get a lot of gold and some of the other heavy elements that get enriched as well. So you've got to make stars in order to enrich your interstellar gas. And when you do that, you know, you lose some of the gas, gets lost to stars either that hang around for a long time or that hang around forever. Um, although it turns out sometimes white dwarf stars can either collide with each other and that sends some heavy elements back. Or if they have a regular star to pull matter from, they can explode and send some heavy elements back. So you get a little bit back here, but the vast majority of white star, white dwarf stars never do that. So mostly that mass is just lost. So if you want to have stars, even population two stars with just a little bit of heavy elements, you have to have gone through this cycle once. And the signature of the first generation of stars would be no heavy elements whatsoever. And we have not seen any stars that have no heavy elements whatsoever. There have been a few cases where we think maybe 
We've seen some really distant stars that look like they have no signature of heavy elements, but um, this far, it's not been completely clear that that's what we're seeing. It's possible that it's actually not a star that we're looking at, but something else, or you look harder and eventually you find a very faint evidence of um, heavy elements in it. So that's what you would look for in the first stars. Star, you know, stars without heavy elements. If there were any in our own galaxy, they would have to be 0.8 times the mass of the sun or less, because anything bigger than that would have died by now. Um, and by the time you leave behind a white dwarf, of course, it's all heavy elements because it's the core of the star where fusion happened. At the outside of the sun, fusion only happens at the core of the star. So the surface of the sun, which we can see, its um, element abundance reflects the gas cloud that the sun formed from. So let's go back and think about when would the first stars have formed? Well, we need to start by thinking about the history of the entire universe. So the universe began in a very hot, dense state. In fact, there's not even a moment of beginning here because we don't understand the moment of Big Bang. The earliest we can talk about is this thing called inflation, which is not important really for this talk. What's important is that it ended, and that's kind of what you can think of as the beginning of the universe. Um, and it wasn't. It's was actually a very bright and stormy night. Um, the next thing that's really important after that is about 10 minutes after this. So you've got this beginning here. This is 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So you can think of that as zero seconds. You get up to here at about 10 to the one or 10 to the two seconds, something like 10 to the two seconds. That's more like 10 minutes. Um, and once you get 10 minutes in, that's when the elements form. So before protons and neutrons were there, but the universe was so hot that if a proton and a neutron stuck together to make a heavy, like a, a, a deuteron, it's the, the heavy hydrogen that's in heavy water. Um, if two of them stuck together, it wouldn't be very long before a photon or something else really high energy came along and blasted it back apart. But eventually the universe expands enough that you can make the elements. And so here is the point where you're left behind mostly with hydrogen. Mostly the protons still didn't combine with anything. 75% um, hydrogen by mass, 25% um, helium by mass, and very, very trace elements, trace amounts of lithium and beryllium, and that's it. And then the universe is just plasma. It's just plasma. It's hot not compared to the beginning, but compared to what we like to think of as a reasonable temperature. And the universe expands, is plasma, until you have this moment called the, uh, well, the emission of the cosmic microwave background. That's, two things happen. First of all, all of the electrons stick to mostly hydrogen nuclei um, and stay. And so you go from plasma to just gas. And so it becomes neutral gas. Um, also, the universe is now thin enough that photons can stream forever. They no longer are going to bounce off other atoms. Most photons that either bounced or were emitted just keep going forever at that point. Beforehand, they didn't go very long before they bounced off something because the universe was so dense. So here, because the photons were bouncing off of stuff, things were either emitting light or scattering light. There was light was doing stuff all the time. But right here, at about 300,000, maybe 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, that stops. And all the photons that had been either bounced or emitted at that point, they're still flying through the universe. They're all still there. But nothing else is emitting light. There's nothing emitting or bouncing light. And so that's why we call this the Dark Ages, because it was literally dark. Nothing's emitting light. It's a really good... Uh, reason to call something dark ages in my opinion uh, but you get to a few hundred million years after that and things start emitting light again uh the first stars in fact and then we see some quasars really early, early as well so the first stars were the end of the cosmological dark ages because they emitted light and that's really what we're interested in and notice here we're talking a hundred maybe a couple hundred million years after the big bang which is still 13.6, 13.5 billion years ago compared to where we are now. All right. And now how do we know that this happened at that time? Well, one of the very important things that the first stars would have done is some of them, at least, it turns out probably all of them, would have been really massive, really hot stars that emitted a lot of ultraviolet radiation. And what ultraviolet radiation does, 
I'm going to skip this because I actually talked about it. What ultraviolet radiation can do is knock the electrons right back off the atoms. So if you have a hydrogen atom, of course, this happens with anything. This is part of what's going on in sunburns. Um, not all of it, but part of what's going on in sunburns is um, some of your atoms on your skin are getting ionized. And then these electrons go off and put energy into you and cook you a little bit. So um, a high energy photon, which just means light, ultraviolet light, hits an atom, and there's enough energy there to free the electron. So the, the photon gets absorbed. The, um, it's an ion is something that's got fewer electrons, so it's um, positively charged, and the free electron goes flying off. That's called ionization. Although we call it reionization because remember the early universe, everything was plasma and all the electrons were free. And then there was this transition to where the universe became neutral. All the electrons got captured, but then the first stars reionized almost everything. Eventually there was a, enough early stars that they could reionize the gas. And now today, most of the gas in the universe, not all of it, there's still our molecular clouds that we can make, um, more stars from, but most of the gas in the universe nowadays is ionized. And a lot of that happened at this event we call reionization, which was when the first stars happened. Now, this is from a simulation that was done um, about eight years ago of uh, initial star formation and galaxies of various sizes. Um, redshift is how we measure these things, but here's the thing that'll make a little more sense down here. If you look at the time, this is in giga years so 0 0.2 giga years is 200 million years and what's plotted over here there's all these words but what's important is um sfr which stands for star formation rate this the top one actually probably makes a little more sense and you can see there's various different models they have because we don't know perfectly well when this happened but what they say you know what, what they're saying based on the constraints they have and what we do understand is that something like 200 million years after the Big Bang, the star formation rate started to pick up. This is a log plot, if that means anything to you. So what that does mean is that the star formation rate is actually picking up really quite fast at around 200 million years after the Big Bang and got pretty fast close to 1 billion years after the Big Bang. So this would be when the first stars were showing up with something like 200 billion years after the Big Bang. Um, there's actually uh, there's an observation that was published just this year that that looking at some neutral gas at really high redshift, really distant gas, that suggests that stars had been formed and already emitted some of their ultraviolet radiation at least by 180 million years after the Big Bang. So we're talking 100 to a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. That's when reionization happens, and that's when um, the first stars would have been. Another simulation, this is actually an earlier simulation that looks at the history of star formation throughout the universe. So this would be the beginning. And then here we have um, just shortly, a few hundred billion years after the beginning, it picks up and actually peaked um, uh, a while ago. Uh, I'm totally lying to you. This is the beginning over here. <laughs> this is backwards in time. We are looking back in time. So um, it started really low and it peaked about um, a billion years after the Big Bang, and then it's been dropping off since then. Uh, yeah, that says more or less the same thing. I'm going to skip it. Now, okay, so we know observationally that the universe re was reionized and there had to be the first stars to do that reionization. So they're, they're out there. The first stars would have happened. They would have been formed about 200 million years after the Big Bang. But remember that low mass stars last longer than the age of the universe. So if there were any low mass first stars, we ought to still see them. And yet we have it. So here is the question is why not? And part of that is you got to think about how stars actually form. So we're going to go back to one of these gas clouds that has to collapse to form stars. And there's this always this um, competition that goes on 
actually in all kinds of things in space of gravity versus pressure. So the brown things here are supposed to indicate the gravity trying to cause the entire cloud to collapse. Why doesn't it just collapse from gravity? Well, there's pressure and eventually it's pressure supported so that the amount of pressure pushing out balances the gravity that it's pushing in. We call that hydrostatic equilibrium and it stays pretty stable. That's why the sun is, um, that's, that's why the sun is stable and doesn't just collapse all the way. It's got a nice balance between gravity and pressure. And interstellar gas clouds have much lower pressure than the sun, uh, but they're really huge. And sometimes there's one big enough that collects together with enough density that gravity can cause it to start to collapse. And that's great. So if you can start collapsing one, let gravity start to win over pressure, it can get smaller. And eventually you can make stars because you've collapsed it enough but there's a serious problem and that serious problem is is that as the gas cloud collapses it gets higher to higher density right so nobody's surprised that's what it means to collapse but the other thing is remember we talked earlier about dropping things on the earth to kill dinosaurs you know we do that is um as the gas cloud collapses it heats up because the the gravitational energy that's lost as it collapses on itself goes into heating up the cloud. So as the cloud collapses on itself, it gets hotter and hotter. And when things get hotter, that causes their pressure to go up. So as the cloud collapses, it causes the pressure to go up and that will stop it from collapsing any further. So the question then is, how do you get rid of that heat in order to keep the pressure from stopping the cloud to collapse any further. If you want to collapse a cloud, you have to cool it in order to collapse it. And so it, let's look at today, nowadays, in our interstellar clouds, what is it that does the cooling? Well, it depends on the temperature of the cloud. Um, so this temp, this is about 100 Kelvin here, which is a nice cool cloud. Um, but still, it's got to cool because if it starts to go above that, it needs to cool. Well, let's look at what radiates away the energy carbon this is actually ionized carbon radiates away a lot of the energy for these low clouds even though it's just a trace amount you know two percent ish of the stuff that's there carbon oxygen other carbon and then molecules with carbon and oxygen in them carbon and oxygen are responsible for radiating away a lot of the energy that is generated when a cloud starts to collapse. And again, you have to do that because if you don't radiate that energy away, it stays in its heat and that heat will make the temperature go up, which will make the pressure go up, which will make it harder for the cloud to collapse. And it's only when you get it to really hot clouds that hydrogen molecules can start to contribute to causing the clouds to collapse. And then when you get above, when you get, so this is at about a thousand Kelvin, when you get close to 10,000 Kelvin, it's actually hydrogen atoms start to contribute. Um, so if you think about the third stars, they didn't have any carbon. They had no carbon. They had no oxygen. So these methods for losing the energy that they gained as they started to collapse didn't work. And so they had to get hotter before they would start to lose energy so that they could continue to collapse more. And so the way you can still collapse when it's hotter is you just have to have more mass. You have to have more mass. So there's enough gravity there in order to overcome the pressure that does isn't relieved because there's not carbon and oxygen there cooling it off. So as a result, the very first stars which did not have hydrogen and oxygen to help cool off the gas clouds when they were collapsing had to all start much more massively. Now there are questions that are open about could those clouds have fragmented after they collapsed, thereby leaving behind some lower mass stars. And so that's, you know, there's modeling that suggests this, but we don't know enough to, to be able to have high confidence in our models. And so different people come up with different answers. But the clouds that were able to collapse to form these stars would have had to start at 100 to 200 or more times the mass of the sun. So issues of fragmentation aside, the very first stars were likely all really massive, and that'll be true even if they fragmented, because you know you fragment a 200 solar mass cloud into four stars, you still have 450 solar mass stars. Nowadays, yes, we can collapse much smaller bits of cloud because we have the carbon and oxygen necessary to allow the clouds to cool off and collapse to in you know much smaller masses. But back then, there was no carbon and oxygen yet because the first generation of stars 
hadn't happened before the first generation of stars. So there was nothing to have made the carbon and oxygen. So the first stars were probably all very massive, very different from today. Remember, today we mostly make low mass stars, but the first generation of stars were probably really massive. And they did a few things for the universe. They reionized it. Okay, great. But the other thing they did is because they're really massive, when they died, they would have left behind black holes, pretty big black holes, not as big as galactic center black holes, but pretty big black holes. Now, it's also possible that some black holes directly collapsed from mass getting really dense, but these stars would also have left behind big black holes, and as those black holes started to collect together and collide, they would have formed the supermassive black holes that would have formed at the same place as the centers of galaxies. So the first generation of stars got a lot of stuff started for us. So, the question is, um, have we seen any of these first generation of stars? Now, here's the problem. If they only live a million years or something like that, and they formed 13.6 to 13.5 or 13.4, whatever, billion years ago, we have to be able to look that far back in time, which means looking really far away, because light takes time to travel. So if you look far enough away, you're looking at light that was emitted 13 billion years ago. So... If the stars were all really, first stars were all really massive, there, none of them been formed recently, we have to look really far away to see them because, because we have to look far enough away that light took more than 13 billion years to reach us. And when you look at things that are really far away, they are really dim, they're really hard to observe, and this is why we won't have seen them yet. Um, but there are a few cases, you know, people are trying, and there are a few cases where there were really tantalizing maybes that we have seen them. And there was a really good one a few years ago. There was this um, galaxy called CR7. Uh, had a, uh, this galaxy was observed emitting its light 13 billion years ago. So this galaxy was observed in ultraviolet light and so that's the light that you would get that would ionize stuff although it turns out it was actually observed um in the infrared because there's a thing called redshift that i've talked about in other talks but i'm not going to really talk about right now but ultraviolet redshifts all the way to the infrared um, if you're looking this far back in time so we were looking in the infrared but it was what we call rest frame meaning at the place where the galaxy was ultraviolet i don't know what the cr stands for it's just somebody's catalog designation so somebody made a list of, of sources that they were looking at it was at cr1 cr2 cr3 so on and so forth um, and this was number seven on that list so cr doesn't really stand for anything interesting um, in fact i didn't even try to figure out what it stood for because i figured it was just going to be the name somebody's name of their catalog or maybe you know cosmic radiation source or something like that who even knows i know it's sad um anyway this this paper here in 2015 suggested, and some other papers later suggested, that this source labeled A was a cluster of first stars forming. Now, they were embedded. Some of these other things do, did show some heavy elements. So it looked like it was a mix of places where, you know, with this thing called a population three wave. Remember populations one and two? We use population three to talk about the first stars. So the idea would be that Population three stars start to form, and then they go supernova, and their shock waves might trigger some population three stars to form nearby. And so the idea with this would have been a first generation of stars that was forming next to where stars had formed already. However, later observations actually suggest that even though this is a really, really early generation of stars, it wasn't first generation. So we still don't think we've actually seen first generation stars, although for a little while there we thought we had. Um, so this is this remains a really interesting source. Uh, one of the things about this source is that it's really complicated and messy, and it's almost certainly a collision result where you had two condensations, maybe today what we would call galaxies, but two condensations of stuff that collided together. Um, I don't remember what the metallicity is. I think they saw some triply ionized carbon lines eventually when they looked for it, but I don't remember anymore. But if you look in this paper... Um, it's, that's not actually the paper that measured it, but this paper refers to the paper that measured it. So, so you can go look that up there and figure out what it was. Um, um, there, there have also been suggestions that this is not a star cluster at all, but it's in fact um, gas accreting onto a pretty big 
direct collapse black hole. So that's a black hole that would have collapsed just because there was so much mass in a small enough area that it all collapsed into a black hole, and then it started making accretion disks around it and doing that. So, But um, this latest paper here, 2017 paper, seems to disfavor that idea. So, but, you know, so there's been a number of papers on this source in the last few years. Here's the summary. Population three stars. In comparison, so remember, population one is stars like the sun, lots of heavy elements, disk of the galaxy. Population two has small but not zero amounts of heavy elements. Um, population three stars would be stars with no heavy elements at all. They would be the first generation of stars, and there's none that we see in our galaxy. Um, they would have to be almost entirely hydrogen and helium. That makes it the gas cloud harder to collapse because there's no you know, metal lines. There's no carbon and oxygen there to radiate away energy. That means that the population three stars were likely very massive, which meant they were very hot and very bright. It didn't live very long before they exploded. So that reminded me of the Jack Lee didn't credo, the credo, where he's talking about a meteor, but I think that you could say, I would rather be a superb population three star, every atom me, of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent population two star. And it just doesn't work as well as the meteor and the planet. But still, the idea is that population three stars, really hot, really massive, formed early, lived fast, and died hard. And we haven't seen them yet, but we've gotten really close. We've seen some tantalizing suggestions of secondary radiation related to that that has allowed to make us to put some constraints on when they happened. Yeah, they're James Dean stars. And uh, in the next few years, I really do expect observations to start putting really serious constraints on these because the James Webb telescope will go up, instrumentation's been getting better, and we're really getting close to actually seeing light pretty much directly from these. So... Um, I will stop there and ask if there's any other questions that people didn't ask or people that they typed and I didn't answer. Um, so are there any other questions? Brown dwarfs, population two stars. Uh, there will be population two brown dwarfs and population one brown dwarfs. So usually, when stars form, there will be some. And I don't. I haven't kept up with it, so I don't know what the, you know, how many brown dwarfs you get for every red dwarf. There will be some when a, a bunch of stars form that just are brown dwarfs. Um, and so there would have been some with population two stars. Um, probably the fraction's a little higher with population one stars, uh, but they'll be around in both cases. Brown dwarfs are really, 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 really dim, so they're hard to observe directly. Uh, but we have observed a bunch directly. Yeah, oh, no, brown dwarfs are not smaller than Earth size. Brown dwarfs are very much like Jupiter, in fact. Uh, Jupiter is... Jupiter is smaller than a brown dwarf, but Jupiter is not much smaller than the smallest brown dwarfs. The biggest brown dwarfs are something like a tenth the mass of the sun. Jupiter is like a thousandth the mass of the sun, more or less, maybe, you know, within a factor of ten. So, um, but it turns out that the sizes of even the tenth of the mass of the sun brown dwarfs are very similar to the size of Jupiter in terms of volume. And that has to do with uh, Fermi degeneracy and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah, actually, I wouldn't say that Jupiter is a total loser as a star. Jupiter is just a pretty awesome planet. I don't think, I think Jupiter wasn't even competing in the star category. Um, it just, it turns out that the lowest mass brown dwarfs are not very different in mass from Jupiter. And actually drawing the line between this is a gas giant planet and this is a brown dwarf is not something that's trivial to do. Yep, and so when the monoliths get there, then we can all have apotheosis and feel good about ourselves. Right. Any other questions? 
So I will say, check the Science Circle calendar to see what other talks are coming up. Um, I think I'm on the calendar. I'll be coming back in the beginning of May, and I'm going to talk about parallel universes. Um, in particular, so Stephen Hawking died recently, and his last paper had something to do with parallel universes. And of course, as with all things, it got a little bit oversold in the media. It's like, his last paper proved that we live in a multiverse. It's like, no, his last paper was one of many that lots of people write about ideas of the multiverse. So I will try and tell you about Stephen Hawking's last paper and about um, serious scientists thinking about parallel universes uh, at the next talk. And then check out the Science Circle calendar or the groups or just ask Chantal for what other talks are coming between now and then. All right, well, thank you all. At this point, I have another thing I need to run off to. So I will run off and do that. So I'll see you all again here.